All right, we're going to get started here, guys. So um, excited to have everyone online that's here. So we got a good group. Um, we're going to get started. So today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about the. Um, hang on one second here. We're going to be talking about the uh, seller paperwork and what you have to fill out and how to fill it out and all that kind of stuff um, for a seller. So, um, but before we get going. Um, on that. Any questions, anything that you um, want to ask that doesn't necessarily have to be related to the seller packet, but just anything before we get going? All right. And Ash threw his name in the chat box, which is awesome. But for this one, if you have not, I need you to put your license number as well. I noticed from the class on Tuesday, there were a couple people who did not put a license number. And now I don't need it every time, but I need it at least one of the six classes. So if you have not put your license number in the chat box, do it for at least one of the classes. Once you've done it, then you're you're good. I don't need it again, but um, but at least one time, give it. Give me your license number. All right. Okay. Well, here's what we're gonna do. Hopefully, you guys that are online all got a copy of the printout that I uh, sent in the email yesterday. If you did not get it, I am going to throw it into uh, the chat box here. I'll put a copy in here so that you can see it. I'll, I'm also going to pull it up and show it online so that you can see it here to where I can put it in the chat box. All right, so if you're on your phone, I don't think it'll let you see it, but if you're on a computer, you should be able to see the uh, chat box there, in the chat box. Okay. All right. So let me get it pulled up and we'll get rocking and rolling here. To where you guys can see it. All right. Light, do you guys want lights on or off? That's a little bit better. That's better? Okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, so here's what we're going to do. So the idea of today is we're just going to go through and, and talk about the seller packet and, and hit all the information that uh, is in there, talk about how to fill it out. And, and really, so I forgot to say this on Tuesday as you guys started with Rob, but the division of real estate, actually, let me back up even further than that. I have been training and specifically doing a lot of new agent training for the last um, about 16 ish years, somewhere in that range. And part of that process is what I would do is I would teach this stuff and, and I would go through and teach, teach the agents how to fill out the paperwork, you know, so first how to prospect, how to go get leads, how to fill out the paperwork, all that kind of stuff. Well, I had an agent that had come through the training that I had done and that agent said to me one day, hey, I have to miss class um, next week because I have to go take the 12 hour new agent course. And I said, oh, great. Go take the 12 hour new agent course. You can just catch the next class the next time it comes around. And so he left, he went over to the board and took the 12 hour new agent class. And then the next week when he came back to class, I said, so how was the 12 hour new agent class? And he's like, oh, so boring. And I said, oh, Okay, why, why was it so boring? And he said, because it was already stuff you had already taught us. And so it had me then realize, well, geez, I should just go get the certified to teach the 12 hour new agent class, because if it was all the same stuff I already was teaching, then I might as well just go teach it like I'm already doing, but at least give you credit for doing the 12 hour. So that's what I did. Yay. So yeah, exactly. So, um, so that's kind of the background on this is that, that that's kind of where it came from. Now, with that being said, the reason I tell you all that is there were a few things that the division wants to make sure that I cover that I was not covering when I was teaching it before I had gotten approved for the CE. So we will make sure to add those things in and I'll typically point those out to you throughout the six classes as we go through it. I'll point out to you the things that... Uh, that, okay, the division wants to make sure you understand this. So there are a few things we'll do that with. But the idea of what I want to make sure we're doing is just helping you to understand how to fill it out, what should go there, how do we know what should be filled out, all those kinds of things. So if you have questions, though, um, if you guys that are on Zoom, either unmute and, and ask me. I'm, I'm not as good when I have people in the room of keeping an eye on the chat box. So if there is something in the chat box that... Um, 
that you uh, that I miss. Some maybe somebody else can unmute and tell me. But all right. So here's what we're gonna do. So here's where I want to start with is just if you notice right here at the top, we've got exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure. But right underneath that, notice what it says. This is a legally binding contract. Read carefully before signing designated, designated agency brokerage. So on this, um, just keep in mind, this is a legally binding contract. And too many times agents, that when we're filling these out, we don't think of it from the standpoint of like, these are legal contracts. And, and I think sometimes because we aren't attorneys that we sometimes feel like, oh yeah, we're just filling out this paperwork and I just got this paperwork to do and blah, blah, blah. But this is a legally binding contract. And, and so keep that in mind. If for some reason your client was like, I want to have my attorney look it over, then that's fine. Like let them, because this is a legally binding contract. Now you're going to have that very rarely that somebody does that, but just, just in case. All right. So now let's go down to the next section. The agreement is entered into effective blank date of month of year, uh, by and between century 21 and blank. So on the day, month, and year, what should we put in there? I mean, okay. now to some extent, this almost feels like, well, duh, the date, but, but what date? What, what are, what are we going to put? The day you list it. Okay. So the day you list it, when you say that, meaning if I was on the MLS. Okay. So yeah. So Joanna's saying the day that it's going to go on the MLS. Okay. Any other thoughts? Well, the day that you just uh, sit with your seller and sign your contract. Okay. And you have the permission to be able to go ahead and lease the property. Okay. So so now, so we've got the day that it's going to go on the MLS or the day we're sitting down and filling it out with them. Any other thoughts? I would think, yeah. Well, she's like, because you wouldn't put it on the MLS unless you had this document signed first. Okay. So Swen's saying that we wouldn't put it on the MLS if we did, which is true. We're not going to put it on the MLS without this being signed. Okay. That could be signed late at night and you didn't get to it till the next day. So. Okay. Good. Good. So, uh, so let me ask you this question. Let me phrase it this way. From when we have an, a listing, how long do we have to put it on the MLS? Okay, so I've heard a couple days, three days. How about somebody on Zoom? Unmute. Five days. Isn't it uh, 24 hours? Okay. So, all right, so let me explain to you. So it used to be, this has changed. But it used to be from when you took a listing, you had five days to get it on the MLS. Well, recently, and, and this is nationally, not just here in Utah, but nationally, the National Association of Realtors said, hey, like technology's come a long ways and there's no reason you couldn't put it on within a day. So from when you have a, an effective listing, you have one day to get it on the market. So now you'll notice up here that here, there's, here's the key things on this. This agreement is entered into effective the blank day of month of year. So ultimately what I would say, there's not necessarily a right answer on this of like what should you fill in as the date on that. But, but the key piece that I want you to remember is whatever you put as the effective date on this, it's got to be on the MLS within one day of that. So what if, which this is what a lot of times what agents want to do, what if what I want to do is I want to get professional photography done before it hits the MLS because I don't want to just use my iPhone to go take pictures. So what should I do on this effective date? Alter it. I mean, can you do that legally? Okay, so Swen, Swen says uh, alter it. Well, this is a legally binding contract. Okay, so yeah, so he's like, can we post it? Sign, you can have a sign and then just put a date to match or whatever. Yeah, so good. So here's the idea of this is ultimately what we want to do is if you know you're going to want to get photography and things done on it. But you have five days to do, by the way. To, don't to, you? To, to, five days to get pictures posted on it. Oh. Uh, I don't yeah. remember. I think it, it used to be 10 days to get some pictures. It's five days to get it listed on the MLS. Well, no, it's five one day to get it listed on the MLS, but it's five days. days to get pictures. There we go. Okay, good. So it might not really be. So you picture. can still 
put it in the MLS and then the pictures will come later. That's right. You could put it in the MLS and get the pictures later. But typically most people want it to hit with those. So if that's the case, you would want to put it so to where um, you're dating it to be a few days later, knowing that you're going to get the pictures. That's totally fine. Yeah, because this is saying is entered into effective the blank date. So essentially by having that word in there effective, we're saying it's, okay. it's we're going to get it signed today. So you're going to have them sign it and date it today at the bottom of the contract. But we're just saying it's not going to be effective until such and such. Date. Oh, so the date that they signed does not have to match that date. Correct. Gotcha. So yeah, the, so just in case you guys online didn't hear, the date they're signing, it doesn't have to match the date we're putting right here. So. I just think one day to get it listed is kind of like, uh, you know, technology has advanced, but we're so much busier than we've ever been to in some sure. ways. And one day doesn't seem reasonable. Yeah. So, and so that's where I guess to me that that's where you would want to put it yeah. dated a few days out. Especially yeah. if you have an assistant and you need to send it to the assistant and you know your office or whatever the situation is. Yeah. It? Perfect. So what if you have a client that's doing a new construction? So you know that they're going to put their house on the market in four months, but you want to retain them as a client, but you don't want to have them sign this. Do you have them sign this and not put the date in? So yeah, great question. So let me, just in case you guys on Zoom didn't hear, what if you got a client that's going to be building a new house, and so they um, are not going to put their home on the market for a few months, would you have them sign this, but date it months down the road? So. This one's a little, this question's a little bit uh, ambiguous, meaning because technically, if I had them sign it and I dated it here, and I, I probably need to ask an attorney because I'm not, but, but if they, if we dated it to be four months out, they signed it today, could they between now and then change their mind, those type of things? My initial thought is I want to say no, because this is a legally binding contract. We're agreeing that starting on such and such a date, you're listing the property with me. But if it's not effective until, let's say, four months out, could they not find somebody else in the meantime and do it without, like... See, that's where I, yeah, so that's what I'm saying is that's where this could be a little bit ambiguous as to, well, what if they went and found somebody else and said, well, your listing's not actually effective until a later date. And, and I would say to some extent, yes, that's true. You probably could do that. And here's why. If you look at our code of ethics, our code of ethics says that you can't interfere with another agent's client. Therefore, you, if somebody has their home listed for sale, you couldn't go interfere with that agency relationship. But our code of ethics would allow me, though, if let's say that um, Joanna called me and says, Hey, I've, I've got my home listed, but I don't like the agent that we've got our home listed with. I want to list my home with you. And I say, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, I'll be happy to help you, but I can't do anything while you're currently listed with that other agent. Now, ethically, I can't tell her to go get out of it. I couldn't tell her what to go do to get out of it. But if she said, well, that's fine. But as soon as it expires, I want to list my house with you. I could say, great. And we could fill this out and date it for the expiration date of her listing and have it all ready to go. Well, so let's see in that scenario, that's what happened. What if she gets an offer before the date I've put in there on her property and sells it? The other agent. Yeah, so I wouldn't get it. So, so where I guess you would potentially run into the issue though is gonna be if you dated this four months down the road and then they listed with somebody else during that four month period, which I would say technically they probably could. And then they sold the home. I don't, what I don't know is then what would happen with this contract because they now don't own the, they now listed a property with you that they don't own anymore. So thankfully it doesn't happen very often. So let, so let's just say ultimately the, the advantage though, why I would probably still do that is because having that seller potential seller sign that four months in advance they're going to probably feel committed to me so that if they did decide to sell sooner than the four months they're probably going to have me do it so i love the idea of doing that i just don't know what for sure would happen if they went and listed it with somebody else for the two months before that or whatever so i think communication probably can help 
when sure. because sometimes I have people that they want to sign but they want to work with me but they want me to come back in a week yeah and I will actually have them sign yep. and I will actually address to them that I'm not going to put a date when I'm coming back because I have some kind of regulations that I need to follow with my company yeah. and they understand that and I'm back they, it's already signed and I put a date in the date when we're going to start yeah. working together. But I usually, I explain what really I'm doing. Yeah, great. Okay, so that's what we're going to do on the, now who would have thought we could have such a lively discussion about that date, right? All yeah. right, next is so that it's between Century 21 Everest and blank the seller. So where do we get the, the name to put in there for the seller? Okay, good. So, so a couple places we could go about doing it is one is get, go to the tax data to get it. The other is going to the title company, which essentially is going to go to tax data, but going to a title company and saying, can you tell me who's on title for this? Now, let me give you a quick story on this of, of what you want to do. So once you get this, especially if you're going to the MLS to pull up and get the tax data, get it from there, that's fine. But once you get the preliminary title report, which so again, what you want to order the preliminary title report as soon as you get this listing signed. So as soon as you get this signed, call up and talk to, you know, obviously I'm going to promote North Star Title since that's our company uh, affiliate, sister company. Go, call up North Star Title and say, I need to order a preliminary title report for this particular property. And, and do that as soon as you get the listing signed. Now, once that you get that preliminary title report, check the, the first page of that that shows who the owners are to make sure that what it shows on the preliminary title report matches what you had from the county records. So let me give you a quick story on this of where uh, that was a huge benefit that the agent had done was I had an agent that was in this training program and he went and got a listing. And when he went out and got this listing, he uh, pulled up the tax records on the tax records, it had the guy's name that he went and met with. He had him sign the listing agreement, came back to the office. He had already been through this class, so he had called and ordered the preliminary title report. A couple of days later, he gets the preliminary title report, and as he looks at it, he notices that it says the guy's name, but it also has some other female name on there. So the agent calls me and says, hey, I checked the tax data. I went out and met with this seller. He signed the listing agreement. And then now I got this preliminary title report, but it's got a different name on it. So what do I do? So what's the answer? What does he need to do? Talk to the seller. And do, for what? Because he needs the other um, the female person to sign too, or else he can't sell the home. Good, yeah. So we got to get the other person's signature on this listing agreement, or we don't actually have a valid listing agreement. So now the market was similar. To, well, I shouldn't say similar. It was nothing like what's going on today, but it was it, prior to what we're going through now, you would have said it was a pretty good market, but uh, compared to where we are today, luckily it wasn't like multiple offers, but the property was, it, the market was in a scenario where when you put a property on, if it was priced good, it was going to get an offer pretty quickly, which he had done. So he gets the preliminary title report as he's in the middle of negotiating the offer. And that's when the agent calls me and says, okay, now what do I do? Because we're negotiating an offer, but I'm missing a signature from one of the sellers. What do I do? And I said, okay, well, go back, to find out who this other person is. And then we got to get her signatures on the listing agreement, but you also need to get her signatures onto the, uh, yeah, the Repsy as well. So he goes, calls up the uh, seller and says, okay, who is this other person? And he says, oh, that's my mom. Well, great. I need to get her signature. Oh, well, we can't. Okay, why? No, she wasn't dead, thankfully. But <laughs> they said, why? And he she said, well, she's on a cruise and she has no access to anything because she's on this cruise. So the agent comes to me again and says, now what do I do? So what, what would you recommend to the agent to do? You're missing her signature. You're in the midst of negotiating a Repsy on it. What what would you what do you think the answer was? Somebody on Zoom. Let's give somebody on Zoom. Let's make you guys participate here. They're gonna have to wait for his mom to come back. Okay, so we're gonna have to wait for his mom to come back. Any other thoughts? 
Let's see. One more person from Zoom first. Let's see. Any other thoughts? Then Lourdes is going to give us her idea. Would it be void? Okay, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's void. It's just not complete yet. So how would we how would we handle it? Go ahead, Lourdes. Okay, what I'll do if I will be able to verbally communicate with and I'm on a cruise, I don't know if I might be able to do a text or something from the mom because I need to hear from her directly instead of just only the son. And she gives me the, the, she's agreed to be able to sell the house. What I will do is I will keep the way how it is um, on the on the form here. And then I will add, and then do adding, uh, you know, as the seller also. Okay. Later. So, yeah, good idea, but can't get a hold of her because she's on a boat is what was what he said. Okay. So let me I, see. Somebody's got something in here. There's no way to do electronic signatures or add an addendum, extend the dates. So the cruise, the we, with the electronic signatures, he claimed there was no way to get a hold of her. So, yeah. so we can't do that. Well, it's I would talk to the other agent. Directly with the other agent to be able to explain the situation and be able to basically hold on until we'll be able to have a final. Okay, good. Yeah. So here's what we did. Very similar to what you guys are saying. Is what we did is we... I told the agent, call the buyer's agent and explain to them what's going on, that, that you, the mom is on title, she's on a cruise, and we're going to have to get her signature. So thankfully, they didn't just give an offer that the seller just accepted, thankfully. It was going to be a scenario they were going to counter anyway. And um, so he said, I said, call and tell them what's going on, tell them she's supposed to be back on whatever date, we'll get her signatures, and then we'll have a deal. But Here's what I told the agent to do is I said, on your counter offer back though, make the counter offer subject to the mom signing the contract so that, that at least if she won't sign it, we're protected. That's good for me. So that's what he did. They accepted it. So now we're under contract. They're ready to start doing inspections. A week goes by when the mom was supposed to be back. The agent calls and says to the seller, hey, when's your, is, is your mom back? We need to get with her. We need to get signatures. And he says, oh, she decided to go on another cruise. So she just jumped on another boat and left for another week. Well, all of a sudden, now that's a little bit suspicious. Yeah. I mean, although I do have actually a sister-in-law that her and her husband, um, Around Christmas time, they, they do that. They go down and go on one cruise and then come back and get off the boat and get on another boat and go on another cruise. So like I've, it's not unheard of, but it's like a little suspicious that like, well, when she got off the boat, couldn't we have talked to her or something? So anyway, we, we call the other agent. Hey, FYI, apparently she's gone back on another week's cruise. So we'll uh, get it for you next week. Finally, the next week goes by and the agent finally gets a hold of the mom our agent, the listing agent, gets a hold of the mom, says to the mom, hey, here's what's going on. We need to get your signature. The mom says, what are you doing? Like, I cannot believe that you have, number one, listed the property without my signature, and number two, that you're now negotiated an offer and, and have it all pretty much in place. The whole reason I'm on title is I bought that house for him. He's not mentally competent enough. It, and now I don't know if legally you can was or wasn't, but in the mom's mind, wasn't competent enough to make that decision. And that's the reason I'm on title is because he tried this once before. And so I put myself on title so it wouldn't happen again. Wow. So how would you like to be the listing agent to have to call the buyer's agent to say, hey, FYI, the mom's not going to sign. <laughs> yeah, so, so here's the point of this. On this name for the seller, Check the, te the tax records, but don't fully rely on it. I have seen, I would say they're probably right. And I don't know, I'm making up this number, but 95% of the time, they're probably correct. I, I usually, when I do my listings, I actually prime the, the county. And because a lot of times they don't really update names, or sometimes there's a trustee or whatever. Yeah. So I go with my paper and I will show it to the seller. Uh, is this correct? Or there's any changes or whatever? Then so I will be able to have a little bit more. And then I check with my title when they pull. Yeah, good. Yeah, so I would say that generally they're correct, but there are times you're going to, you, you will, it's not so rare that you might not run into it. You will run into times where you're going to see. So maybe 95 is too high. Maybe it's 90%. I don't know. But 
you're you will run into times where it ends up not being correct so just be prepared and know that when you go out to have the seller sign it or when you're sending it to them through a dot loop or something just ask them who all is on title so that you can verify that that is the case now what if though when i check that it's in the name of a trust now what I'm so excited to have people in person. I'm sorry, Zoom people, that I'm ignoring you, but if it's I'm not really. So say trust. that again. If it's, if it's a trust, you put the name of the trust, let's say the Ginger Trask Trust, dated January 26, 2011, comma, Ginger Trask Trustee. Okay, good. Yeah, so you're going to put the name of the trust in there, but then who's going to sign it? The trustee. Good. Yeah. So you got, so here's how I handle it. So when I come across one that's in a trust like that, one of the things that I'm going to do when I talk to the seller is to say to the seller, I need a copy of the trust showing who can sign on behalf of the trust. So who is the trustee? Yeah. So that, and, and I always just blame it on the, the title, which is true, by the way, the title company is going to need this. So if you can get a copy to me, if you have one right now, I'll take it. But if not, I need one as soon as you can get a copy to me. And for me, the reasoning behind that is I want to make sure I'm getting the signatures from the people who really are on the trust that have the right to sign on behalf of the trust. So just one more time. The trust's name, the, the trust, the date, current date, and then the owner of the trust. That's yeah, so well, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Do that if you just put the name of the trust on there, it's going to be sufficient. Okay, yeah, but as long but, as the signing person is the owner of the trust, yeah, whoever signs it, you want to just verify that they are the I'm trustee yeah. of the trust or that they have the right to sign on behalf of the trust. Okay, good. So that's what we want to do on the seller portion of this is we're is just essentially verify and make sure that you guys have the right one. Now, let me give you actually, a, 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 and I don't know that this fits into what exactly what we're talking about right now, but this story just came to my mind that I want to share with you. That's kind of a interesting story. So I was getting in the elevator at, um, I, I might have been here. I don't remember where it was at, but I was getting in an elevator and I saw a, an escrow officer getting, there was an escrow officer getting in the elevator at the same time that I was getting in the elevator. And I knew this guy, I didn't use him as an escrow officer, but I had known him for a lot of years. And so I asked, I just say, Hey, how's it going? And he said, I just had the weirdest closing I've ever had. Now he has been an escrow officer had been at that time for probably 20 years at least. And he said, I just had the weirdest closing I've ever had. And I said, okay, and then like, well, as long as you've done this, it had to be weird. So I want to hear the story. What happened? And he said, um, these people just sold their house that they didn't mean to buy. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, they didn't mean to buy the house. I'm like, how, how could that be? Like, stop and think about it for a minute. Like, when you buy a house, we make an offer and you get, like, this due diligence time frame to go do check it out. And I'm like, how do you buy a house? Like, a car or something? I mean, well, even a car I wouldn't see. But a TV or something, like, well, I didn't really mean, like, oh, Amazon. I, I didn't mean to click on the button and I bought the house. Like, I, I mean, you know, that doesn't work that way. If I just, I went on to Zillow and I clicked buy now and I they took my credit card and I bought a house. Like, it doesn't work that way, Right. So I'm like, how did that happen? And he said, here's what happened is, and so I guess the point of my story is trust, but verify. Okay. So what happened is this, is they, they went and looked at two houses, these buyers went with their agent. They looked at two houses after they uh, had gone and looked at the two houses. They said, we want to buy this one. The agent went back and wrote up the offer, but when he put the address, he put the address of this one. So he put the wrong address of the house that they wanted. They got the contract and did what most buyers do there. Most buyers are not stopping and looking at the contract to be like, oh, did the agent put the right address for the property? They signed it. The agent now goes, now remember, they meant to write an offer on this one, but he wrote it on this one. So the agent then, the, list, the buyer's agent calls this listing agent of the wrong house, says, hey, I got an offer for you sends it over, they get it, they negotiate it, they come to an agreement. The people are so excited uh, about the house. 
and a couple of weeks go by and they're, I don't remember the background on their inspection, but for some reason they go and drive by this house, the one that they thought they were buying and they see somebody moving in. And so they go over there and stop. Well, first they call their agent and they say, Hey, um, we just drove by the house that we're buying and there's somebody moving in. Like, do you know what's going on? And he says, I don't know. Let me see, see if I can find out. So he calls the listing agent, this one, and says, hey, my buyer said that somebody's moving in the house. Do you know what's going on? And he's like, I have no idea. Let me find out. Hangs up, calls the seller, and the seller's like, no, we're still here. Nobody's moving in. Okay, calls back. No, there's nobody moving in. Moving in. And, and the buyers say, say, no, like we're in front of the house. There's a moving truck. They're here. Okay, hold on. Calls back the listing agent. No, they said there's a moving truck and people are moving in. No, I promise there's not people moving in. So he calls back. They promise they're not moving in. All right, well, we're going to go find out what's going on. Then. So they get out. They go walking up to the people carrying boxes from a U-Haul or whatever. And they say, um, what are you guys doing? They said, oh, we just bought this house. We're just moving in. What do you mean you bought the house? We, we're buying this house. Well, no, we closed on it. We we bought the house and uh so they call up their agent they said they bought the house anyway come to find out they finally tracked down that he had written the address wrong for the the property and and so but so then i said to the escrow officer i said but yeah but you still have like due diligence and you could still go back and say well that's not the house we wanted and uh he said yeah they called their agent and said well, we don't, that's not the house we wanted. We wanted the other one. And apparently the agent said, well, there's nothing you can do about it now. You have to buy it. And they said, oh, okay. And bought it, which is crazy that that happened. But so here's the point. Trust, but don't trust, but verify, right? Okay. I don't know where that story, but it just popped into my head and I was like, I got to share it. It's a good story. story. Yeah, it's a great one. It's it's funny, but okay. All right. So next let's go down here to terms of the listing. So the terms of the listing, the, the, and we're, I'm not going to read through this whole thing, by the way, but just the places we're filling in, we're, we'll talk about, and, and a few other pieces. The seller grants the company, including blank, the seller's agent, which so obviously your name goes in there, right? As the seller's agent, uh, as authorized uh, by the company, blah, 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 and ending at 5 p.m. on blank day of month of year. So what do we want to put in there? So this is the expiration date of our listing. How long should we give it? Six months. Okay, six months. Any other thoughts? In this market, 24 hours. <laughs> right. In this market, 24 hours will work. You could do a year if it's uh, a luxury home, if it's over a million dollars. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks. Should you're so, so There are going to be times where maybe, you know, um, there's, there's a property. I don't know if it's still for sale, but there was it for sale in holiday. That was like $25 million that I think has been listed for sale for my whole career like for 25, 25 years. They're probably not true, but, but yeah, there are going to be times like if you were selling a $25 million house in Utah, you might want more than six months to, for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not necessarily a right answer for how long to put in here. I will give you my rule of thumb. And this, this is m- me talking now. For me, typically, I try to err on the side of not going less than a four month. For me, I usually say I want a minimum of four month. And the idea behind it being is, is I want at least now in today's market, like Joanna said, we probably could put it on for, you know, hey, we're going to list it for 24 hours and we're going to be good like that probably could work. But for me, I usually just kind of have as kind of the minimum that I will go is four months. Now, are there exceptions to that? Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, in today's market, if somebody said, we'll give you a month and they're going to price it where it should be, like, I probably wouldn't say, nope, got to have four months or I'm not listing it. Like, I probably would say, okay, that's fine. But I still would probably tend to want to get more than a month even really just for me. I want to have, be able to have time to get the job done basically. So for me, I usually will err on the side of four months is kind of where I do it, but kind of the general rule of thumb of if you surveyed all agents in the, in the country and said, how long do you do? Six months is probably going to be your, your normal answer that you get. But the reason we don't have it defaulted as six is there may be scenarios that you do it for less or longer even. So, okay. 
All right, so, um, and then it goes on to say the exclusive right to sell or exchange the property by the seller described as, and you're gonna put the property address in there on that line, all right. Next then is goes down to, and we're gonna spend just, I'm not gonna go through every single section, but there's a few I'm gonna hit on. So the next one is the brokerage fee. And what this is basically saying is in the event that the property is um, sold, leased, or exchanged, that they will then owe us a commission. Okay, so that they're gonna pay us a commission. And in this section, I've got it in here as saying is 7% plus a 495 of the acquisition price. And then, uh, so here's the idea of this is, the reason I use this form with 7% is don't just assume and default to 6% because there are times that it makes sense that maybe you do a 7%. And, and I have done actually a lot of 8% listings. And, and what I would do is I would go into the seller and I would explain to the seller that we're going to, I'm going to charge them 8%, but we're going to offer four across the MLS to entice people more to come and purchase. And, and in fact, we have an agent up in our Centerville office by the name of Trent Hyde, that Trent for a number of years, and this goes back into the 2008, 9, 10, and 11 timeframe, he would go into the seller because at that point, so which by the way, in Salt Lake County, do anybody know how many homes are for sale right now active in Salt Lake County? No, it's more than 30. Yesterday, they were just over 1,900. For the whole state is around that 1,900, but how about Salt Lake County? Well, like three, three, it's, it's between four and 500 homes right now. Well, in 2000, and I don't remember the exact year, I'd go look it up, 10, 11, somewhere in that range. In 2010, there were 9,000 homes in Salt Lake County. So we have like 500 today. There were 9,000 back then. So back then, one of the things he was doing was he would go to the seller and say, we're going to list your home at 8%, but I'm going to offer five to whoever brings in the buyer. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you were to go back and look at his listings on the MLS that he did that on, and you did a CMA based on that time frame, what you will find is his homes were selling at the top of the market in those areas. Now, if you stop and think about the reasons why that would be is imagine you're the buyer's agent. Okay. So let's, let's just do a hypothetical real quick. Now I don't let me give you the little asterisk on this. I don't recommend doing it the way he did it. I'm going to tell you the way he did it, but I wouldn't do it the way he did it. Cause I think, well, I'll tell you why in a minute, but he would go and he would list the property at 8% and then he would offer 5% on the, on the MLS. So be the buyer's agents for a minute. Now, and, and for this exercise, think like most agents think. I'm not saying like be who you necessarily are, but think about just in general, the way agents would work, okay? So I'm the listing agent. I go listed at 8% and I offer five to whoever brings in the buyer. I'm the buyer. See, now, see, Lord is already answering. Like, I want it. Yeah. Do you want to find the buyer for that house? Of course. If you saw that, are you not going to go look through your SOI and be like, okay, who do I have in here that could be interested in buying this house? Incentive, yeah. Okay, so that's so notice the first thing that all of a sudden you have now enticed a bunch of agents to want to buy that house or to find a buyer for that house. So if you can get your seller to understand that part of the process of us getting a buyer for their home is we first want to entice the agents to want to show it. Well, if, if, if you see you're going to get 5% and let's just say it's a $300,000 house, that's $15,000 compared to typically nine on uh, most agents or in today's market, um, six or 1500, right? Okay. So that's the first thing. Notice that that's going to entice people. Now, how about this though? And now again, this is the part where I got to say, you got to think the way most agents think, not necessarily the way you might think, but when it comes time to negotiate and the buyer, so I'll pick on Lourdes, even though she may not do this, what I'm about to say, 
but we're going to pretend, okay? It's it actually, don't be you. Think like most agents, okay? okay. <laughs> so you're going to now write an offer on the property. Okay. So it's my listing. I'm offering you 5% if you bring the buyer. Okay. Your buyer says, let's make them a lowball offer. How are most agents going to respond to their client when they want to run a lowball offer? Well, the chances to be able to get the, you know, that offer accepted, it's going to be a little lower just because you're, you know, lowering your offer. Yeah, so here's what I've found is, yeah, typically what's going to happen now is that the other agent is going to actually probably, even though maybe they shouldn't, and we'll talk about our fiduciary duties in a little bit, but even though they maybe shouldn't, the other agent's going to kind of, try to encourage them to, Hey, we want to get this offer accepted. Like, so let's, we don't want to offend the seller. And, and, and so notice that. Okay. Now what about this? Now we're under contract. Your buyer does their due diligence and they want to come back and ask for a whole laundry list of stuff for the seller to repair. How are most agents going to respond to that, to their buyer? How I just Not you. How do most agents going to respond? Oh, yeah. Is the buyer's agent? Yeah. Some of them, they want to kill the whole thing. They get but, extreme. But I get, here, let me rephrase it. Does the buyer's agent want to kill a deal based on due diligence if they're going to get 5% no. on it? No. Probably. So now look, again, like I said, we're going to talk about fiduciary duties and they shouldn't do that. Right. But human nature tells me they're going to, I'm not saying they're going to violate the code of ethics, but they're going to do everything they can to try to keep that deal together. Because what happens if they cancel it? If their buyer cancels it and says, yeah, let's go buy this other house. Yeah. yeah. And again, I totally understand and get based on our code of ethics, they shouldn't do that. But I just have this personal belief that I think most agents are going to, I'm not saying they're going to violate it, but they're going to try everything to not cancel the deal that meaning, like, I would hope that if their buyer is saying, well, I just don't want the house anymore, I think it's a problem, that they would go, okay, but well, let's not buy it. But but I would think they're going to first go, well, well, let's go back and ask the seller to fix the stuff. Let's go, like, they're going to do everything they can to keep that deal together versus now put yourself in the scenario, the other scenario. Your buyer's gone out and looked at two houses. One of them is offering 2% on the MLS and the other one's offering 5 and your buyer says, I want to buy the 2%. And now they do their inspections and they're like, Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you, what are, what are, what do you think agents are going to, again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but don't, what do you think some agents are going to do? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm fine with you. I would. And, and in fact, I, let me give you guys a quick story of real life scenario for me. And I, you guys can tell me if you feel like I violated the code of ethics. I don't think I did, but you, if you guys think I did tell me. So I'm out showing some properties, townhouses in Riverton. I don't know why I'm full of stories today, but <laughs> we got to be here for two hours or hour and 40, what? Cause you got a live audience. I know, right? That's probably what it is. Okay, so we're out. I'm showing these properties. This is a friend of mine's son and his wife. Okay, we're out in Riverton and I'm showing uh, them these townhouses. And as we're out there looking at the townhouses and we are um, going through the properties, as we're going through there, this property on this townhouse, they start to kind of give the buying signals. They start showing me, like, hey, we kind of like this property. And, and for me, I, I think I've probably changed a little bit now, but back then, pretty much every property would offer 3%. It was rare not to see a 3%. And so for me, I never honestly, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not bragging by any means. I just, for me, I never even looked at the BAC until my client was ready to write an offer. And because partially because I just, it was 3% always. Well, this particular time, they, I can see while we're in the property that they're starting to get interested. Well, I've got the MLS sheet in front of me. So I glance down at the BAC and it says two and a half. And I go, oh, serious? <laughs> so we get done looking at the property. We walk out. And as we go out to um, the car, they say to me, all right, we want to think about this uh, overnight. And then we'll let you know in the morning if we want to write an offer. Now, Typically, what I probably would have done is said, hey, we don't know if other people are looking at it. And, and this actually is a good 
I hate to use the word line because that makes it sound bad, but this is a good objection handler. I don't know what to call it, <laughs> but that I use is to say to people, look, the good news is you want to think about it overnight. You actually have our whole due diligence period to, to think it over. Like you got a week to 10 days basically to think it over because you can cancel for any reason. So typically I would have been like, hey, if you really like the property, we probably ought to write an offer and, and you'll have the whole due diligence period to think it over and, and we can write it, submit it to them. And even if they accepted it and tomorrow, you're like, yeah, we changed our mind. We could just go cancel it because I want to get them to write the offer because I don't want them to miss out on it. But keep in mind, I looked down and I saw two and a half percent. I'm like, yeah, think it over. Should decide if you want it. So later on, an hour or two later, I get a phone call from the listing agent. The listing agent says, hey, can you give me feedback from your showing? And I say, yeah, they actually liked the property and they're considering writing an offer. That here's the only problem is they've signed a buyer broker with me, which I know we're doing the listing agreement. I should have saved the story. Should I just can't cut off the story and tell you the rest of it? I know where you're going <laughs> Yeah, okay. So um, I said, they've signed a buyer broker with me that says that they're gonna pay me 3%. So if they buy your house, you're only offering two and a half percent. And as a result of that, what that means is they're gonna have to bring in another half of a percent to me. Now, here's the truth. I wouldn't charge them, my client that, but I don't have to tell the other agent that I'm not going to charge them that. And if they wanted to buy the house, I would write the offer. But I'm going to try to get 3% out of the other agent. So I just said, you know, I noticed on here that it's you're only offering two and a half. And they'll have to pay in the other half and they can't afford to do that. And the agent then says to me, well, you can't do that. And I said, what do you mean I can't do that? And he said, you have to look out for your client's best interest, not yours. Which, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I Yes, I do have to look out for my client's best interest. But, but what you're, you're making sure they don't have to pay you an extra half percent. Well, to some extent, that's how I was looking at it. Is I'm ensuring my client doesn't have to pay me the half of a percent. Now, the truth is, I wouldn't have charged my client the half of a percent. I, if they would have wanted to buy it. So, But the agent said, well, that's just not right. And I said, well how did I violate the code of ethics? They said they wanted to show the property. I showed it to them. I, I haven't violated. I didn't not show it to them because of the, the BAC. I just also wasn't going to be like, Hey, do you want to buy the house? And so here's what happened the next day. Actually, here's the thing. The next day I didn't, I, I waited for them to call me again. If it was 3%, I would have probably been calling them the next morning. Hey, did you want to write an offer on it? If they, if they wouldn't have written an offer the night before, I would have been calling them and said, hey, do you guys want to write an offer? Let's see, we see what we can get the property for. But because it was 2.5%, I was kind of like, well, they said they'd call me, so I'll see if they call me. And eventually we talked, and they were like, yeah, we decided we don't want that house. I was like, whew, good. And then we they went and bought one at 3%. Now, do you guys feel, did I violate it? Like, if you think I did, tell me, that's fine. Because maybe I did and maybe I'm, but it, it, I also want to hear what I did that violated the code of ethics. I showed them the property. So meaning we have to put our client's interest first and I did put their interest first, but, but we also, they had signed a buyer broker with me. So there was nothing to stop from saying you were going to have to pay me the 3%, I could have said that to them. I wouldn't have, but I could have said that to them. You're going to have to pay the other half of a percent. So I don't think you did because you have, I mean, you have a contract with them saying they owe you that 3%. So you're like, I'm looking at their best interest. Make sure they don't have to pay me that. Yeah, percent. good. Now, here's the interesting thing. After I hung up with the guy, a couple, you know how like an hour or two later, you're like, oh, why didn't I think to say this? That was kind of the scenario. I was like, why didn't I think of that? Well, because here's the thought that I had, and I wish I would have gone back to him. And, and so this is why I tell the story and relate it to here in terms of the, the brokerage fee on the listing side of things is here's what I had. The thought that I had is I kind of wanted to say, are you looking out for your client's best interest? Meaning, did you tell your client when he, I don't know what his listing agreement was for. I don't know if it was four or five or sit, maybe it was six and he was going to keep three and a half and give me two and a half. I don't know. But part of me wanted to say, did you explain to your client 
that by you offering it on the MLS for less than a 3% was going to discourage agents, was going to create exactly this conversation we just had. Did you just, did you, because see, here's what I believe. To, I truly think to some extent he was in more of an ethics violation than I feel like I was because I would, I, my client knew nothing of any of that conversation going on. And if my client would have called me that night and said, write the offer, I would have written the offer. So just know that. I, now there are scenarios I would have said, well, you're going to have to pay the other half of a percent, but because this was a friend's son, I was not going to go, Hey, you got to pay me, but I didn't have to tell the other agent that, but I kind of feel like when somebody goes in and lists one and decides they're going to offer and granted commissions are negotiable, but if you're going to offer less than 3%, I feel like, are you doing hold the ethical thing with your client by not telling them, Hey, you're going to, potentially have less people come and, and do it. I helped my sister buy a condo just a few months ago. And well, maybe it's been more than a few now, but a while ago. And on it, the agent was only offering 2%. And so when I wrote the offer and we were in a multiple offer scenario, I wrote the offer and I told my sister, we are putting in here that the seller will pay 1% of the purchase price towards my commission so that you don't have to. And that's my sister. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, now truth is again, would have I really, if we couldn't have gotten it, would have I charged my sister that? Absolutely. No, I would have just kidding. But, but we sent it over and we got the deal, even though we asked for the 1%. So, so my point on this is just don't just assume you can't do a seven or an 8%. There are scenarios that it makes sense to do that. There are scenarios that you may say to the seller, let's list it at seven and I'm going to offer three and a half. Now, like I said, in our current market, it probably doesn't matter too much. You're going to get 80 offers either way, but, but what kind of a name do you want to build in the business? And so I just feel like you're going to help keep transactions smoother with the other side if you're offering a little bit better of a commission. So now with that said, Crystal, do you want to come up real quick? We have time. Do you have time for your chat? If you're quick. If I'm really quick. Yeah, because yeah, because I've already been verbose today and okay. I'm behind. Yeah, I'll be really quick. <laughs> but but let me give her a so let me just give you the plug. You don't need to say sure. But you can still because I know what you're going to talk about. Yeah. Um. Re so Crystal did a closing. I don't know how long's it been. A couple months. Yeah. That was a property that had listed that was a seven percent listing. So we had taken a seven percent listing, but the word from the office got down to her that it was only 6%. And this seller had signed. And then after the seller had signed, we noticed, uh oh. And like, I was a little worried, like this is gonna be one of those scenarios where we're just gonna have to take six and just deal with it. Oh, well. But Crystal is such a rock star. She's like, nope, I got it. And she called up and I don't even know what you said. What did you say to the guy? Um, I just said, Hey, you know, I've, I've got this addendum and you agree to this price to pay your agent. This is what your closing costs are going to be. And he, I just explained to him, you know, this is what you agreed upon. He's like, oh yeah, yeah. I remember, remember signing. I'm like, okay, great. So I'm going to change it. This is where your bottom line is going to be. And he was totally fine. So the seller was <laughs> like, yeah, that kind of sucked because yeah. he didn't have with less money. But, but so my point is Crystal's a rock star. So go to her for title. Cause, um, <laughs> it, seriously, I, it, one, I look at it as a, she got me an extra 1%. I mean, cause truthfully with me, I'm an amiable. I would have never gone back to the seller and been like, Hey, you owe me. I, sorry. We kind of messed up. You still, cause I'd have been too worried. He would be mad at me, but Crystal's like, no, I got it. And so she got me an extra 1%. So. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to go really fast. So you guys are talking about sellers, a couple things to keep in mind. So as he was saying, Super important to get down the light so they can see all the zoom. drafts of your agreements with your seller. So for your commission, um, I know there's sometimes to be multiple drafts of it. Sometimes you can start at seven and it goes down to six. Make sure those get to title so we don't have issues like that with commission. Um, another thing to keep in mind with the seller, if your seller owns a home in an entity, whether that's an LLC or a trust, make sure you collect the articles of incorporation if it's an LLC and trust certification if it is a trust. Title will need those documents to confirm that your seller can actually be the person signing off on the home. Um, and of course, with trust, it can get a little complicated. People don't realize this when they set up their trust. 
So start this at the very beginning as well. If you know your seller is in one, that they have an account in the name of the trust. Title has to issue money, proceeds to the owner of the home. So your client doesn't actually own the home, the estate owns the home. So they have to have a bank account with the estate or the LLC's name. So those are like my top things with sellers as I've seen a lot lately. Um, and then I have two quick things that Title is doing fun um, in the next couple of weeks. So tomorrow we'll be handing out cake pops to everybody. So if you wanna come down for Valentine's Day treat and you're in the building, please stop by. Um, we're gonna be handing them out all day. And then on Tuesday, we're starting a feminine hygiene drive for um, Women's Day, which is March 8th. So it's gonna start on Tuesday through the 8th and we'll be collecting donation for hygiene products for women. This year, all the donations are gonna to go to the school kids because one of every five teenagers miss school due to the lack of products. So as our first charity drive, we'll have multiple this year, but just really quick hi and hello. Oh. <laughs> if you have any questions, let me know. Do you have a list for the women's? Yeah, drive? so I have flyers, so I'll leave them over here for you guys. And then if you, um, for people who are virtual, I'll send Russ a copy of it and he'll send the PDF over to you. Okay, all right, all right. awesome. Awesome, thanks, thanks for your Thank right. you. Okay, so we've been an hour and I've covered two sections of the reps of the listing agreement. You guys prepared to be here for five, six more? Yes. Can I ask you a real quick question? Yes, yes I have a please. Question too. Okay. Yeah. Down on the bottom, there are just thank two you, you, you. spots for sellers' initials. What if there's three? Can you just put a little box in there Under? and have them? Do yeah, it? just have them initial below it, or yeah, if you're doing dot loop, drop another one in there. That's what I've done. Yep. Go ahead. This Lord. is not on the selling, but on the buyer's part. Just pretty quick. Uh, a lot of the listings right now, they're offering you actually a backup for only just 2% or 2.5%. Now, when I have my representing the buyers, they usually sign my contract, right? And I usually put it 3%. So, and I've noticed now the other homes that are like 2 or 2.5%. So what do I, what do you recommend to do now? Because right now- Can we hold that question till we get to the buyer okay. packet? Is that okay? Well, I'll ask you uh, later. So yeah. Well, no, I want to answer it, but, but I think it's more relevant when we get into the buyer side of it, since we're doing the seller. Is that okay? Okay. I mean, if not, I can answer just, it. But... I'll remind you. Okay, remind perfect. You. Yeah. Okay. So next then is protection period. So on this one, here's how I explain this to the seller, is when I'm going through this, I explain to the seller that this section, this protection period, is basically the way to keep honest people honest is how I usually explain it. Section three is to keep honest people honest. Because what it says basically is if within blank months, so how, what should we put in there? How many months? Three months. It depends on like months. Okay. So I have it at three months and it just depends on the house. Any other ideas? I think six months and then it just depends on the house. Six months, okay, anyone else? Okay, there's not a right answer on this whatever just here's my recommendation don't put zero is my recommendation and the only reason i say that now now to some extent after i say what i say you might say well i might as well put zero because for me it's about keeping honest people honest so for me i typically um, if i have a listing and it expired I'm probably not going to go keep an eye on that. I mean, if, if I couldn't get them to relist with me and they, it expired because they were whatever, I'm probably not going to like keep checking on the, the property to see, did they relist it and sell it to, because essentially what this is saying is that if within so many months after the expiration or the termination, that the property is acquired by somebody that saw the property while I had it listed, I'm entitled to the commission. But I'm probably not going to worry about tracking down to see who bought the house and where, like if my listing expired, I'm not worried about it. But if you put in there zero months, we had recently in the company, this happened. A person had the property listed. They had put zero in there. A buyer had come through the house and looked at it. And then the listing the listing expired and like two weeks later that buyer just went to the seller and said, I want to buy the property. And they said, okay. And they sold it to him. And then our agent was going back saying, Hey, I should be entitled to the commission because the people who bought it looked at it while I had the property listed. Well, the problem is this protection period, they had put zero in there. So as a result, 
they had, they really had nothing to go back on because they're saying it's once it expires, it doesn't really matter. So for me, put one month, three months, six months, uh, you know, whatever you want to eat, the rest of your life. I don't know. <laughs> so was that fresh? Yeah, it ended up being a for sale by owner. Yeah, go ahead. On Zoom. You said you said no right answer there, but is it typically one one month? Um. I don't know that I would say there is a typically. I would say it's somewhere between one and six is what people like. For me personally, okay. I usually just do one. But yeah, that's what I'm thinking. To okay. some extent, one could come back and bite you too. Like more likely, three is probably is a better number, I guess, if I stop and think about it, because okay. it's possible that I have the property listed, somebody looks at it, it expires, and then a month later, the person comes back and goes, "Hey, I want to buy it." less right. likely for that probably for three but the longer it is the less likely so there's not a right answer just know if you put zero and somebody goes and buys it don't be you know upset about it i'm saying it's more than a month because to do the loan is 30 days right so two months so yeah i'd months. say a couple months two three yep all right next section is seller yeah go ahead so could that sell either be a fisbo or represented by an agent and you would still get your commission yeah good question so technically the way our contract is written here if we look at it let me highlight the part it says uh after the termination or expiration of this listing agreement the property is acquired by any party to whom the property was offered or shown by the company the seller's agent the seller or another real estate agent during the listing period or any extension of the listing period, the seller agrees to pay the company the brokerage fee stated in section two. So really, technically, if, even if they relisted it and they sold it to somebody else, our contract says they've agreed to pay us a commission if that person buys it. If you look at the MLS's listing agreement, it's worded a little bit differently. It has the same verbiage, but it says, unless listed by another agent. So ours doesn't say that, so technically, they would still owe us. Now, are we going to be able to go after it and get it? Probably going to be difficult to go actually collect it if they've been, if it expired and they then listed with another agent. If they didn't list with another agent, I think we got a pretty good chance. But, but the way our contract is written, it doesn't matter who they listed with. So to some extent, you would want to use that with a seller as your listing is expiring of just saying, hey, if anybody buys it that we showed it to, we would be able to commission. Now, like I said, if they go to list with somebody else, probably not going to end up getting it. But. All right. Sellers warranties and disclosures. This next section basically is, and, and I'm going to pick up the pace here. So stop me if you have questions, but I'm going to pick up the pace a little. Um, sellers warranties and disclosures just says that they have the right to be selling the property basically is their warranting that they are the owner, that they, if it's in a trust, that they are the trustee, if it's in a corporation, they have the right to sign on behalf of the corporation. And it's telling them that they need to disclose anything they know about the property, which we'll get to seller disclosures in a little bit. Okay, section five is all about the agency relationships. This is explaining, and, and, and how I'm telling you guys is how I would be explaining it to a seller, is basically section five says, I'm on your side that I am your agent, I'm looking out for your best interest, that I have all my allegiance and everything is to you as the seller. Section 5.2 talks about my duties if I were to be a limited agent. And what that means to you is that in the event a buyer came along and wanted me to show them the property, would you want me to show the property to somebody if they wanted to see it? And what's the seller going to say? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, if that happens, then I would have to be a limited agent. And basically what that means is that I couldn't tell them the lowest you would be willing to accept as an offer, but I also couldn't tell the buyer the, or tell you the highest the buyer's willing to pay. So I just have to stay neutral when it comes to negotiating. I can't pick one side or the other. And that's how I usually explain that to them. All right, so uh, on the buyer side, when we get to the buyer packet, I'm gonna go into the fiduciary duties a little more than I did today. So we'll cover that in another class. All right, section six then. Oh, so I'm gonna have them initial here and date all that. Section six then is the expiration. What this is saying is, uh, let me see. Hang on. I did notice a question pop up here, let's see. How do you feel about being a dual agent? Oh yeah, actually I love it. 
For me, I love being a dual agent or a limited agent because um, the other agent, I have found the agent on the other side of the transaction is really easy to work with. <laughs> and part of why I say, I say that jokingly, but here's the other reason I say that. Honestly, I think a lot of times that the reason that transactions fall apart is because of agents, not because of the clients. And so for me, I love being that because you, it cuts out the ego of the other agent. Is So that's, yeah, to answer your question, I, I like it. I know there are some people who don't. In fact, I actually used to work with an attorney. We had at a company I was with, we had an attorney that was on staff, um, similar to what we do here. But this particular attorney, I was talking to him one day, and he said, limited agency or dual agency makes zero sense. And he said, that would be like me going to court and saying, your honor, I'm here to represent the plaintiff and the defendant. Like, could you imagine an, an attorney doing that in court, standing up? Your Honor, here's what you need to know about why you should side with the plaintiff. Now, but 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 on the other hand, here's the why the defendants. Like he's like, it would never work. You can't do that. And he said, and it's no different in real estate. It shouldn't. You shouldn't be able to do it. But I like doing it. So all right. Next then is expiration. This is just saying the expiration date of the contract automatically extends to the closing date if the property goes under contract. So where that's helpful is if we had put in the expiration date to be one month and two weeks later we got an offer and it didn't close for a month after that, we're now two weeks past our expiration date. Essentially what this section is saying is if we get an offer on the property to close after the expiration date, it automatically extends the expiration date of this contract. Okay. All right. You got to be two weeks. No, so whenever it doesn't matter. Could be the day before. Yeah, just whatever. If if the expiration back there in section one was going to be tomorrow, but we weren't closing for a month, the fact that we went under contract and have a closing date automatically extends this contract to the closing date. But we need to have an addendum. No, because of, be, yeah, because of this section, we don't need an addendum. Yeah. That's what makes it, that's what's great about this is, it, again, th this is one of the scenarios. These are, there are a few scenarios of things that you should use our listing agreement, not the um, MLS. The one on the MLS is fine, but it doesn't allow for, unless they've changed it, it doesn't allow for this. All right, next. Section seven is professional advice. What this is saying is, and here's how I handle it. With a seller, when I get to this section, is I tell them what this section says is don't trust anything I tell you. And then they usually go, what? And I'm like, yeah, what this says is that I'm trained in the marketing of real estate. And so if you ask me questions about, am I going to have to pay taxes on this? Don't trust whatever I tell you because I am not the expert. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a property inspector. That's what this section is saying is don't rely on me for those type of things. Go to a professional in that area. I'm trained in the marketing of real estate. Okay. But I always start it with the seller by saying, this says, don't trust anything I tell you. And they usually will laugh and be like, what? So, all right. Section eight, dispute resolution. This says that if the dispute arises, that we will go to um, arbitration before or mediation before uh, going to court, okay? So that's what this is. We're agreeing that if the dispute arises between us and the seller, that we will go to mediation first before we go to court. Then section nine says, in the event we end up in court, that the prevailing party is entitled to reasonable attorney's fees, okay? Section 10 here is then going to talk all about advertising and the authorizations the seller is giving us. So when I get to this section with the sellers, I'm just explaining to them, here's what this section says is that you're going to give me that authorization to advertise the property for sale. And that, and then I'll go through these and just say that we can disclose the, to the MLS, the after closing the purchase price that we got the square footage from, and we'll check the box of wherever we got the square footage from, that we'll, uh, we can obtain financial information. We have a key to the property. We can put an MLS lockbox on the property, that we can hold open houses. We can put for sale signs or sold signs. We can order a preliminary title report. We can order a home warranty, and that we can communicate with the seller about selling real estate. That gets us past the do not call list or an extra layer of protection with it. 
that we could put the earnest money into an interest bearing trust account, which we don't do. So just so you know, we don't do it. They give us permission to here in this, uh, that the property, that when the property is pending or under contract, that the seller's agent is not to present any more offers. Now you learned in real estate school that if you get a written offer sent to you, you have to present it, right? You learned that in real estate school, but our contract here says in the event that we get that, the seller is instructing us not to present any other offers to them. So we don't have to now and because of that, okay? So even though the law says you have to, this is gonna override that because you and the seller have agreed we're not gonna present any other offers. Now, it doesn't mean you can't because there may be scenarios you would want to, but, and then M here says, in the event that the buyer's agent wants to come present the offer to the seller, that we can tell them no, basically. We can decide if we want them to or not. Back when I first started, that's how we always presented offers. You never just sent it over to somebody. You would show up to either the office or the seller's house and you would sit down and tell the other, the listing agent as the buyer's agent, I would walk in and go, okay, here's our offer. Let me tell you about the, my clients and they just love your house and they're looking forward to, you know, their kids going to school here, blah, 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 blah. blah. And here's our offer. And then usually my buyers were sitting in the car. And so you'd walk in, you'd hand it to them and then you'd go sit in the car while they looked at it and wrote up a counter offer. And they would walk out, their agent would come out to the car and tell you, here's what you, I would get out of the car and meet them. And they would say, here's our counter offer. And here's what we're thinking. And then I'd go, all right. And then we'd get back in the car and I'd go, okay, now, so here's what their counter is. But it was, there was a lot of nice about it. Cause we would put together a deal right then, wow. you know? So I actually was thinking last night and I don't know if this would work. So, but something to consider in today's current market, nobody's doing that. Ask for the ability to go do that go present it to the seller and see if you can put together the deal right then, rather than well, we're going to take multiple offers until next Friday at 7 30 PM. Oh, you know? Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. We're going to, we're going to wait till we've got 300 offers yeah. to choose from. And it's like, do you really need 300? But anyway, all right. So this gives us the right though, at section M here is if somebody, if you're the listing agent, somebody were to call you and say, we want to present our offer that you could say, you could decide if you want to or not. Okay. All right. So, Section 11 is about personal property. And here's how I handle, go ahead. I think there was a, was oh, did somebody on Zoom have a question? Yeah, I, Rose. So uh, I, we just lost an offer that we put in and I'm just going, you really, really have to wait till closing to find out, you know, what, how bad your offer was or, you know, how good it was, but we just thought we put an extremely good offer in and we lost it. And you just, you can't call it the agent and say, and ask, you know, what, what did they accept? You know, what was the offer that they took? You can. Just, it seems kind of frustrating. Yeah. No, you can call and ask them. And, and She's, she wouldn't tell me. So here's the other thing I would say to kind of keep in mind. I saw recently um, somebody put on Facebook, an agent that um, actually used to be with our company, but that he was bored one night and went and looked at, um, I need to go look this up again because I can't remember exactly how he did. He went and looked at a ton of the recent sales to see how much above list price they sold for. Because because what are you guys hearing and or doing in terms of above list price and writing offers? How far above? Russ, okay, Russ, I just had one. Uh, property listed for three seventy two, and yeah. we we put in an escalation clause that we would go a thousand dollars over. Any top offer, of course, they had to show us what it was, you know, approved within 24 hours, up to uh, three three ninety five. So you went, we went from three seventy two to three ninety five okay. escalation clause, and we lost it. Okay, so what? Give me some other ones. Four twenty five, and we got a cash over four eighty five. Four twenty five to four eighty five. Now cash is gonna be a little different. Okay. My friend listed her house for three seventy, and had offers over four hundred and ten thousand. Three seventy to four ten. So do you know what they ended up? Did it close yet? It did on Zillow yesterday. But you don't know what the price was? So what this agent claimed is, is he went and looked, most of the properties were still only within about 10,000 above list price, even though now cash is going to be different because it's not going to be crazy. But so to some extent, here's my point in answering that question is keep in mind, sometimes you may have given an offer that was very high. But if I'm a listing agent, I'm going to be looking at those offers and I'm probably going to be pre prepping my seller for don't get too excited that they got a 410,000. They didn't. 
but I went for the lower offer because she said my house will not appraise for that. Yeah, see, that's just it. It's not so. Here's the thing I want to make sure you guys understand is most I would hope most listing agents are going to look at it and say like it's not going to appraise for that. We had that appraiser come in and talk a few weeks ago. Maybe it was a month ago now or more even. But and I don't know if you guys were here, but he kind of said like. Part of our job as an appraiser is to not let the market get too far out of whack. So even though what he said is even though us as agents get so frustrated because we're like, I got 30 offers and they were all higher than your appraised value that you've given. So how can that not be what it is? He said, to some extent, part of what they do is, and what a lender appreciates that they do is that they kind of keep the market from just totally taking off. So, so as, as a listing agent, you should be looking at that and going, okay, just because it's the highest doesn't mean it's the best offer. Mm -hmm. And so from the other side of that, so Carla, for what you're saying, is it's very possible that there was some other terms in there that looked better. So let me give you a quick example. I've got one. That's yeah, as a, yeah, just, yeah. What, what could have made that any better? Okay, well, let, me, uh, let me give you an idea. Okay. I've got one that I'm closing on next Tuesday that is a uh, family friend that what happened is we went out and saw the property. There was no offers on it. And the my buyer was like, it's not perfect for what we want, but we also understand what's going on in the market. So, you know, we'll take it. So I called up the listing agent and said, when I showed it, you said you had no offers. Is that still the case? Yep, we don't have any offers. We sent over, so it was listed at, uh, shoot. 980, I don't know, something like that. We offered 960. So knowing there's no other offers, we went a little bit lower at 960. In the process of that though, before they countered us, or yeah, they did counter, but before they did, the agent called me and said, we've got another offer coming in, but my clients want yours. Now, let me tell you why they wanted ours. Because I called the listing agent and said, here's the scenario. My buyers are in a lease until May, the end of the year. They're jumping on properties now because they know it might take them until May to get one. So they're already in a lease. What's the scenario with your seller? And she said, oh, they're having a home built. And I said, well, then would it be advantageous to them to close in February, but stay in the property till May? Oh, it'd be huge. See, we got the offer accepted, even though another offer was going to come in, she countered me on a few of the dates, but they accepted our offer at 960 at 20,000 less than what their list price was. But the thing that was enticing to them is we would let them stay till May. And they were like, oh, that's great. We can get our money. We don't have to worry about our getting our home sold while the other one's being built and we can, we don't have to move twice. So that's, the, so that's what I would say, Carla, is if you guys are not calling and asking of other agents, tell me what would be perfect. What is your- I did, I did call. I asked her, you know, you know, what are some of the seller incentives? You know, what are they, you know, what's their position? And she just said, they're not telling me anything. Okay. Well, so then it's, then you, then you don't have a lot to go on, but, but that's where I would say is try to find out. So, all right. Okay. You guys are really distracting me. I'm just kidding. I appreciate the, uh, truthfully, I, let me, uh, since I said that, let me stop. Actually, I appreciate the questions because we got to be here and, uh, Makes it more fun, right? All right, next, personal property. It's just, I'm gonna have to go faster on some of the other points. Sorry. So personal property. No, don't be sorry, it's great. The Here's how I handle it. When I get to personal property section of, of the listing agreement, I tell the seller, if there are personal property things in here that you are worried about, get them out. And then as an example, if you have guns in the property that you're worried about, get them out during the show. If you have drugs in the property, legal or illegal, get them out. If we don't want somebody to steal them. If you uh, have a ceiling fan that you love and you want to take it with you, get it out and change it out before they see it. I have had a ceiling fan and a shelf that, that the buyer came down to, I won't buy the house if you won't include the shelf. And the seller is like, well, I'm not leaving that shelf behind because I like, it's stupid. So. For me, when I get to personal property, I tell them, if you got a shelf that you don't want to include, then get it out now and replace it or patch the holes, whatever. Like, 
same thing with the ceiling fan. The seller was like, I got to take the ceiling fan because I love it. It's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> but then the buyer came along, no, I want that ceiling fan. Sometimes the buyers are doing it not because they really want it, they just want to win. So, <laughs> all right. Yep. Next, section 12 attachments. There either are or there are not attachments. So, either check the box if there are. And if there are, use an addendum to it. If there's not, then check R not. Most of the time, you're going to check R not. The only times that typically you would check there are would be, let's say you were listing a for sale by owner that said, well, we've got these three people that said they want to buy the house. So if they buy it, we don't want to pay you a commission. Great. Let's exclude them then. And I'll check the R box. And on an addendum, I would write the following parties are excluded from this contract for 30 days. And then I would say if they buy it in the next 30 days, they don't have to pay a commission. Makes sense? All right. 13 is equal housing opportunity, just as we're going to follow all the fair housing laws. 14 is the electronic transmissions and counterparts. We're agreeing we can do this through email. Uh, 15 is due on sale. Due on sale only applies if the property, if the seller is going to do like a lease option on it or a seller finance, you should explain due on sale. If they're not, then you probably don't need to worry about it. Okay. Uh, 16 is FERPTA. For Now, this one is important for the seller to make sure they understand. Here's what it said. It is FERPTA is the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. Now, keep in mind, as I explain this to you, it's the government. This is why it doesn't make any sense, okay? So what it says, basically, is if the seller is a foreign investor, the buyer is responsible to make sure that the seller gives to the title company either a social security number or a tax ID number. So if the buyer doesn't make sure that the seller does that and there are capital gains taxes owed, the buyer has to pay the seller's capital gains tax. Makes no sense, right? Like if the seller sells the house and makes a ton, like right now in Park City, this probably applies to a, a lot of sales. You got people who came in from other countries, bought, decided they wanted to buy a house, they bought it. The house in Park City has now gone up a ton in value. They decided they want to sell it because we don't have any snow here anymore. And so <laughs> why come ski in Utah when we're supposed to have the greatest snow on earth and we don't have any snow? But they decide they want to sell the house and they make a huge gain on the sale of that property. The buyer needs to make sure that that seller gets a tax ID number and gives it to the title company or the IRS could come after the buyer. That This has actually happened up in Park City. That The buyer got notice from the IRS. They owed 30 something thousand dollars in taxes. And the buyer's like, what? Why? Well, because the seller was a foreign investor and didn't pay their taxes. And how's the government going to go get it from them now that they're out of the country? So they come after the buyer. All right, so we have to either check the box that the seller is or is not a foreign person as defined in the IRS tax code. Now, and then if they are, we just need to get a forwarding address. And then also just make sure they get a tax number to, to now, if you're on the seller side, it's not as big of a deal. If you're on the buy side, you want to make sure the seller is done. Okay. All right. 17 says this is the entire agreement. There's not anything that's not disclosed in writing. Or if you had any agreements that are not in writing, they don't count. Okay. So I'm going to ask the title company to help you with number 16. Yes. Just so there's some oversight. And yep. Probably done it in the meantime. Yep. Yeah, and 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 the truth is, in today's world, they pretty much are already on top of it and and stuff. But um, it's good just to always check with the kind of thing. Hey, so you, sure you, got so you check is if it's a foreign if it's a, I mean a it's a foreign investment. investment. If, a foreign if it's a foreign investment. Foreign investment. Yep. Does that so that mean? means no resident. Correct. They're not a citizen. You need to make sure they have a tax ID number so that they can pay ta taxes on a capital gain. Yep. Yep. Okay, good. So then they're going to sign. You're going to sign. Don't forget what it says in red right here to ask if they have a property that they need to buy or sell outside of our market area because that uh, could be an outgoing referral. All right. I'm going to next. I know we finished the listing. Here. Woo! All right. Next is the. Uh, Seller is per uh, MLS data input sheet. I'm going to keep this one pretty brief. Here's what I'm going to tell you is this. Any place that you see one of these little dots right here, 
where it's got list price and a dot, short sale, dot. Notice over here, lease, um, nothing there. There's a dot by house number, a dot by street number, not one by street type, not one by unit number. Any place there is a dot, you have to fill that in. It's a required field. If there's not a dot, you don't have to fill it in. So for the new agents, if you're filling this out, it could look overwhelming as you look through this. Just know if there's a dot next to it, you have, you should know the answer. And if you don't, go find it out. If there's not a dot, then you don't have to know the answer. And don't fill it out. Leave a blank if you want to, okay? So like quadrant used to be required, but it's not anymore. And the reason it's not required anymore is because everybody's got a smartphone that they can just plug in an address and go drive. All right. So I'm going to kind of scroll through. If you see any that you have questions on, stop me. But I'm, I'm going to stop on a couple of them. Um, I wish the form order matched what's on mine. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? All right. So HOA, if you have HOA information, throw that. Actually, in I have one. Even though these years, I always trying to figure it out. When it says year built, uh -huh. it says year built and effective year built. Okay, good. So on, on here, let me see if I can find it. Okay, you've got year built and it's got the little dot. So you have to put in a year built. Effective year built, you don't have to put in. So essentially what effective year built is, the idea behind that is for you as an agent to put in if they've done updates. This is a, this is a shortcut to say, so let's say the home was built in 1950 and in 2000 they went through and remodeled it. Essentially the effective year built, you would say, is 2000 is because you're saying all of the amenities and the, you know, if you did, to me, I always think of it as more like the wiring, the electrical and plumbing type stuff is if you've updated it, you updated it in 2000, effectively the components of the house are 2000. So that helps the selling through the house. So yeah. Right? Yeah. The idea is to kind of say, hey, even though it's a building in 19. 20, it's really effectively all the components of it are 2,000. So essential components, could that include There's not a, redid the roof? So that's that's the hard part on this is, is this effective year built is just up to whatever the agent wants to put. So there's not like a, so, so that's the hard part. It's, for me, I personally just think of it as like the electrical, the plumbing, you know, if, if they just redid the roof, I wouldn't say that changes the effect of the roof. That, but that's just me. Because there are going to be agents who go, oh, I got a new roof. Effective year built 2021. Because well, there's more liability. Yeah. So the, what comes to mind for this for me, sorry, just to I guess kind of go off of what you're saying, is uh, one of my buyers last year bought a house that was, took, it was a it was lost cause of the fire. And then they had a restoration company come redo everything as far as wiring, plumbing, and then the can't hear her rush. Okay, I'll repeat. The beams and all that. The main stuff. That 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 would be a good one to put effectively built. Okay. Move effectively the frame. Yeah. Yeah. Probably that would be good. So yeah, what she said is yeah, they had one that there was a fire inside, and so they basically ripped the whole thing apart and did it. And that would be a good example. Yep. Okay. Next, then. If yeah, I'm kind of just scrolling through, so if I see any that I think I would need to stop and talk about, I will. If you see something, stop. Um. Because the, there are a couple here. So there's a couple that come up with questions all the time. And that's this one. On listing type right here, it's got EAL and ERS. And usually I would say, what's the difference? But for the sake of time, I'm just going to answer. EAL is exclusive agency listing. And if you remember from real estate school, an exclusive agency listing means you are the only one that can sell the property. No other agents can bring the buyer. Okay? Exclusive right to sell is anybody can bring the buyer to the property. So Almost always you're going to be checking the exclusive right to sell. It's going to be very, very rare that you'll check the EAL because that, again, that's where you're just saying, I'm the only one that can bring a buyer to the property. Okay. Um, photo instructions. I probably need to update this because this says 10 days. If it's now five, I probably need to update it more. But. And then the other one I want to talk about is dual or variable rate right here, this dual slash variable. And then it's got a yes or a no. The idea of that, and I hate explaining this because then it just gives you guys ideas that I don't want you to go do, but this is how I explain it. A dual or a variable rate. I had an agent that uh, was in my office when I first started as an agent. 
And one of the things that he said to me is that he would go list properties and he would tell a seller, it's going to be 6% commission unless I end up representing the buyer. If I'm going to represent the buyer, then I'll only charge you five. Well, if you do that, you need to check the box of yes, there's a dual or a variable rate. I actually I saw one on somebody commented on Facebook yesterday in one of the Facebook groups for the Wasatch Front Realtors was um, that they had seen an agent had put in there, if the purchase price of the property is this, it's 2% BAC. If the purchase price goes up to this, it's two and a half. And if it goes up to this, it's 3%. Well, then you, I, what I, I didn't go look at the MLS because I don't know. But, but they should probably have checked there's a variable rate, a dual or a variable rate. So, all right. Uh, let's see. The other one that comes up a lot of times from agents is what's the difference between gross and net on the BAC? And gross is just going to be whatever the purchase price is. Net would be we're only going to pay the commission on the purchase price minus any closing costs. So if you ask for ten thousand in closing costs and offered three hundred thousand, the commission will be on two ninety. If it's net, if it's gross, it'll be on the three hundred. All right, the rest of this, I just, I always have the seller look through and check the boxes. I do my best to check the boxes, but then I always have the seller look at it because I found I always miss something. What about these, I'm sorry, publicity, searchable? I'm just curious. Um, what do you need to work with? I just no visible, no searchable. So yeah, you can have the, to where it's not, the address is not going to show up. So you could have put it on the MLS, but without an address. Any of the advertising that does not on the MLS, like, and, and I haven't checked this to make sure exactly it works this way, but any of the feeds that the MLS gives would, so like Zillow would not get your address. They could advertise the property, but there's no address. Do we need to check either one or not? Sure it's actually not a bad idea for us to go back to that. Not, when, when we first started putting properties on the MLS back in like, I don't know, 2003-ish, we didn't advertise addresses. We would just put them on. Here's properties that are in this city. And that way people had to call you so you could talk to them and pick up clients. Right. But then it's gone to where just you gave out the information. But now with Zillow buying everything in real estate to where we're all going to work for Zillow eventually, <laughs> is we might want to start checking those. Not that, but I don't know if that's true. All right. So okay. we should do no searchable? Um, well, I've never checked any of them. I've never, yeah, you don't have to do anything. I usually don't do anything. All right, next thing is down here on the remarks. Here's how I do it. Uh, when on this remarks section, I always just say to the uh, seller, is there anything specific you want to make sure that I put in the remarks? And then they'll tell you, they'll essentially write the remarks for you with that. And I always do it that way because what I found is I would go list a property and I would do my best to write the remarks and I'd put it on the MLS. And then the, the seller would look it up and see it on the internet. And they'd call me and be like, Rush, you forgot to mention that I built the cabinets and how awesome they are. And I was like, oh, okay, let's change it. So what I found is by me saying to them, hey, what things do you want to make sure are noted in the remarks on the, on the internet? They usually will write it for you. They'll say, oh, make sure you tell them that I built the cabinets and how awesome they are. Okay, and then I put it in. <laughs> that way though, if when it shows up on the MLS, if they don't like it, here's what happens. Instead, what I found is they started calling me and going, hey Russ, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. Rather than it looking like I didn't do my job because I didn't do it, now it's they're apologizing to me that the remarks don't have things on. So oh, that's, one of the, that's how I usually handle it is, hey, what things do you want to make sure that I talk about in the remarks, okay? Agent remarks would be just things that you only want agents to see. Uh, the directions and non-standard address, you're really only going to use that. Like, I'll let me give you an example of what one time I used it is I listed a cabin that was up Big Cottonwood. And even though on your GPS, if you plugged in the address, it got you close, but it dropped you off at the wrong cabin. So in that scenario, you would want to put some notes in the non-standard address. Okay. Uh, exclusion remarks and HOA, just if there are exclusions, put it there. If there are things for the HOA, if you'd want the sellers or buyers to know about. All right, next. 
This one I am going to ask you a question. How quickly should you as an agent get the seller, should should you as an agent fill out the seller's report? Never filled it out. I was trying to trick you. Good question. Yeah. All right, yeah, don't fill it out, right? So give it to the seller, tell them to go through and fill these out and sign it. Now you should, as an agent, though, check them to make sure that they disclose that anything you knew about the property, they did disclose if there are things, and just make sure they fill it out and complete everything in sight. All right, next page is the addendum to the seller disclosures. This would be me if you need more room to fill something out from this section here. So let's say that they check yes here and that one line doesn't give them enough room, then you can use an addendum to the seller disclosures and you would just note the page number of the item and then whatever your explanation is, okay? All right, next, wire fraud alert disclosure. Not as important on a seller, but we as a company are just recommending you do this for all um, transactions. And that is just explain to your clients the wire fraud, that wire fraud is going on and uh, to be careful if they're going to be doing the wire. Now, so I'll spend more time on this one when we go to the buyer packet because it relates more to the buyer, but pretty rare that the seller is going to be wiring money to anybody. So we aren't going to do that. Next, which I need to get an updated form on this email, but is the affiliated business arrangement disclosure. Because we this one only has in Spiro, so I need to update this because we now have um, North Star Title too. So, but basically what it is saying, and I want to point out, because sometimes they just have heartburn with this form. <laughs> but what it says here in the bold is you are not required to use the list of the listed providers as a condition of settlement. So we've got it in bold saying they don't have to use them. We as a company, of course, would love them to, but it says you're not required to, and that there are frequently other settlement service providers available with similar services and they should shop around. But RESPA requires, because Everest has an ownership interest in uh, North Star Title and in Spiro, that we have to disclose that so that the client doesn't come back later on and go, well, I wouldn't have used them if I'd have known that your same company owned that company as well. So, Russ, how soon will they update that? Uh, I think it's already updated. I just need to update my package. Okay. Yeah, my printouts is not updated. So any of the forms you get online, you're good. All right, last page here is disclosure and acknowledgement regarding lead-based pain. So today we'll talk about the seller portion of this. When we do the buyer packet, which I think is next week, we'll do, I'll explain the buyer side. So with a seller, you're going to put in the address of the property, and then you're going to ask the seller down here for section two, do they know of any lead-based paint in the property? And they're either going to say yes or no. If they say yes, you're going to have them initial, not check the box. I don't know why I have a check in there, but you have an initial here that they know of lead-based paint in the property. Or, excuse me, they're going to initial that they have no knowledge of lead-based paint in the property. Then down here, you're going to have them initial that they have provided the buyer with the available records if they have any, or that they have no reports or records. So they're initially that they either know or they don't know if it has lead-based paint, and that they either have documents stating that or they don't have documents stating that. Go ahead, Sam. Does this need to be included on house of, say, five years old? Still Good, question. On everything? Good question. Good uh, question. So let me ask you guys. I'm going to ask you two different questions. 1938. If it was born, if it was born, if it was built in five years ago, like Swen said, do we need this? No. Okay. If it was built in 1978, do I need it? Yes. Yes, in 1978, I thought it was before. That is correct. We do not need it in 1978. It's prior to 1978. So if it was built in 78 or newer, we don't need it. But is it going to hurt you put it in? No. no. In fact, I used to do a lot of bank-owned properties of foreclosures where I would sell them for the banks. They include the, a, a lead-based paint. If it was built last year, they include it. Just because for them, they just were like, we don't want to risk it if there happened to be. So, so prior to 1978, you'll use this. So good, good question. All right. So I'm going to skip the buyer part because we'll talk about that next week. 
the agent, you as the listing agent is going to initial section four that you have informed the seller that they have to do this to disclose about that base paint. And technically, it has to be disclosed before the buyer writes an offer. So you should fill this form out and then upload it to the MLS so that the buyer's agents can get it. And then the seller is going to sign it and you will sign it as their agent. And then the buyer's agent will sign it and um, their client sign it. Question. Can you upload the seller's disclosure, all of it, into the MLS? So it's like more than that. Okay, good question. So Swen asked if we could upload all of the seller disclosures there too. The answer is yes, you could. I don't know that I would, but I don't know that I wouldn't either. So if I guess for me, if if it looks scary at all, I would. <laughs> Unless it's a rehab property, then you might be like, I would. Yeah. Yeah, probably not. Probably not for everybody who has to apply, right? If it's haunted? They ask, no, you don't have to tell them if they ask. If they ask, you can't lie. Okay. It's not haunted. They're just delusional. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're they're it's, not, it's not haunted. They're delusional. <laughs> All right, any other questions, guys? Okay, before you guys that are online drop off, if you have not put your license number in, make sure you do first name, last name, and license number. A um, couple people forgot last time. So I, and I don't need it every time, but I need at least once. So uh, let's see. Ginger's asking if I'm going to cover the MLS. Oh, thank you. I didn't mean to do that. So thanks, Ginger. So yeah, in the event that you did list this property and you had put in, I should have said this way at the beginning in section one where we had the effective date if you were going to um, list the property as of today but you didn't want it to hit the mls because you were going to get photos so i meant to say this earlier so thank you Jimmy, is their mls has an exclusion form that you can fill out that says basically you've explained the benefits of the mls to your seller but they're choosing not to put it on at all or they're choosing not to put it on the mls until a certain date and that way it would allow you to go get photos and all that. So that's the other option. All right, Carlos saying, see the chat from Ginger. Is that a different chat or the one that I just did? Yeah, the one that you just did. And I actually have that form pulled up from the MLS and it says at the very bottom that you have up until five business days to deliver that document to the MLS from the date the listing was signed. But it does say, that if you do any public marketing, that your broker is going to put it on the MLS within one day of any public marketing yeah, perfect. of that five days. Yeah, thank you. The idea behind that again, guys, is just what, in fact, we have an agent in California. I don't know if she's still doing it, but she was. She would go list a property and then she had the five days to put it on the MLS and she would then go market the property to try to get the buyer. I mean, especially in today's market, you can see where, if you went and threw it on social media, hey, I'm listing this property, you could potentially get an offer and double end it before you even hit it on the MLS. So to try to be fair, um, yeah, that's the idea. So good. Where was that five-day disclosure at? Uh, that's on the listing exclusion, MLS listing exclusion form that she was talking about. Uh, let's see. And I don't know who mother is. Who's mother? What's your name? That, not that it matters, but she's asking, does Century 21 provide a photographer? Yes. So it's it's through a company, but yes, we do. I didn't realize my name is Mother. It's Mary Kay Reynolds. <laughs> Who is it? Mary Kay Reynolds. Oh, hey, Mary. Oh, yeah, now I can see you. Okay. So, okay, good. Yeah, Mary Kay. So for whatever reason, it says Mother. One of your kids must have put that on. Exactly. They do all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, cool. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Okay, thanks for being here. Hey, so uh, thank you so much. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, next week will be Wednesday, Friday, not Tuesday, Thursday, because we have George is doing the elevate for agents on Tuesday and brokers on Thursday. So our class schedule next week will be thrown off. So it's Wednesday, Friday instead of Tuesday, Thursday. But I'll send an email on Tuesday reminding you of that. But just remember for Tuesday, no class. We'll do it on Wednesday instead. I'm not, I'm not receiving your email. He did. Let's get some emails to you. Now. Do you want them or can we start? Just okay. I will do that.
All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you all on Wednesday. Wow. See, that's what I like having people here. All right. They were too.